Uh, I'm going to welcome uh, everyone to our Sunday school class this morning. And uh, if we have any guests, I was searching on the faces to see if there are guests, but um, I don't see it. If, if uh, you are not a regular participant, you're most welcome nonetheless. Our program this morning was planned by Vic Stolzfus and Irvin Beck. And I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Vic Stolzfus to lead off. But uh, first, John, if you will mute everyone. And then uh, Vic, uh, you will need to uh, unmute yourself. So John, if you would <laughs> mute us all, and then we'll let Vic Stolzfus begin. Very well, this morning, this morning we turn from the pundits and the politicians to the poets. I suppose we've spent hours, at least in the past, with the pundits and politicians, and it's time to invest 30 minutes with the poets. Irvin and I uh, have been collaborating on this off and on for a number of weeks, and that's been a very fruitful collaboration. I appreciate what Irvin has done so much. And uh, John Yoder has uh, arranged a, a PowerPoint to make sure we can see as well as hear the poems. Uh, Urban and I do not promise a feel good Sunday school class. Some of the poems are disturbing and raw, but war is disturbing and raw. Urban has chosen 10 of the 13 poems and the uh, order roughly reflects the historical order of the civil war all the way up to the current conflict in Afghanistan. 11 members of the class will read the poems. <clears throat> First is a poem by Emma Lazarus entitled The New Colossus, and this will be read by Jude Yoder. Lazarus is one of the first successful and highly visible Jewish American authors. She advocated for Jewish refugees, and she was commissioned to write a poem to help raise funds for the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. Lines from that sonnet were engraved on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty in 1903, June. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Next, Anne Hirschberger will read a poem by John Bell, If the War Goes On. John Bell is a Scottish hymn writer and Church of Scotland minister. He is a member of the Iona community and a BBC broadcaster. He works throughout the world, lecturing in theological college in the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States. His songs have been translated into seven languages. 18 of his hymns are in the new Voices Together. Anne Hirschberger. If the war goes on and the children die of hunger and the old men weep and the young men are no more, and the women learn how to dance without a partner, who will keep the score? 
if the war goes on and the truth is taken hostage and new horrors lead to the need to euphemize, when the calls for peace are declared unpatriotic, who will expose the lies? If the war goes on and the daily bread is terror, and the voiceless poor take the road as refugees. When a nation's pride destines millions to be homeless, who will heed their pleas? If the war goes on and the rich increase their fortunes and the arms sails soar as new weapons are displayed, when a fertile field turns to no man's land tomorrow, who'll approve such trade? If the war goes on, will we close the doors to heaven? If the war goes on, will we breach the gates of hell? If the war goes on, will we ever be forgiven? If the war goes on. Our next poem is by Walt Whitman. It will be read by Irvin Beck, who also uh, drafted the comments that I shall read. Walt Whitman is probably the greatest poet America has produced. He is known and admired worldwide. He is certainly the first truly original American poet, known for his free verse style, rather than highly structured forms. In that regard, beat beat drums is an exception because it is highly structured in regular stanza forms. The result is a hammering poetic beat that echoes the violence of warfare. Whitman's mother was a Quaker. He was a nurse during the Civil War. He lived 1819 to 1892 as an American poet essayist and journalist. He is among the most influential poets in the American canon. Urban. Beep, beep, drums, blow, bugles, blow. Through the windows, through doors, burst like a ruthless force. Into the sound church and scatter the congregation. Into the school where the scholar is studying. Leave not bridegroom quiet. No happiness must he have now with his bride, nor the peaceful farmer any peace, plowing his field or gathering his grain. So fierce you were and pound you drums, so shrill you bugles blow. Beat, beat, drums, blow, bugles, blow over the traffic of cities, over the rumble of wheels in the street. Are beds prepared for sleepers at night in the houses? No sleepers must sleep in those beds. No bargainers bargains by day. No brokers or speculators. Would they continue? Would the talkers be talking? Would the singer attempt to sing? Would the lawyer rise in the court to state his case before the judge. Then rattle quicker, heavier drums. You bugles, wilder blow. Beat, beat, drums, blow, bugles, blow. Make no parley, stop for no expostulation. Mind not the timid, mind not the weeper or prayer. Mind not the old man beseeching the young man. Let not the child's voice be heard, nor the mother's entreaties. Make even the trestles to shake the dead where they lie awaiting the hearses. So strong you thump, O oh, terrible drums, so loud you bugles blow. Our next poem is entitled Dulce et Decorum by Richard Owen, and it will be read by Vivian Kayser. This poem is from World War I, 
and reflects the horrors of chlorine gas in warfare. The Latin dulce et decorum is part of a pro-war slogan that was used in Britain to stir up enthusiasm for the war. The full quotation means how sweet and honorable it is to die for one's country. Owen's vivid description of dying of gas is ironic. Ian himself, Owen himself died at age 25 of complications from his own wound from World War I. Vivian. Went double like old beggars under sacks, not need, coughing like hags. We cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helpers just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too, could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Another poem out of World War I is entitled The Man He Killed. And the poet is Thomas Art Hardy. It will be read by John Yoder. He was horrified by the destruction caused by the First World War, pondering that, quote, I do not think a world in which such fiendishness is possible to be worth the saving, close quote. And better to let Western civilization perish and let the black and yellow races have a chance. When he died, his heart was buried with his wife and his ashes are in the poet's quarter of Westminster Abbey in London. John. Had he and I but met by some old ancient inn, we should have set us down to wet right many a nipperkin. But ranged as infantry and staring face to face, I shot at him as he at me and killed him in his place. I shot him dead because, because he was my foe, just so. My foe, of course, he was, 
that's clear enough. Although he thought he'd list perhaps offhand like, just as I was out of work, had sold his traps. No other reason why. Yes, quaint and curious war is. You shoot a fellow down, who'd treat. You'd shoot a fellow down, you'd treat. If met where any bar is, or help to have a crown. Next, we go to uh, poems by a Mennonite poet, Yaguchi, Yurofumi Yaguchi, and uh, they uh, come out of World War II. I should say he's a Japanese poet who writes in both Japanese and English. He's retired now, but served for many years as both a professor of English and as pastor of a small Mennonite church in Sapporo. He had attended the seminary at Elkhart. He and his friend family are close friends with Wilbur and Fanny Berkey. Berkey selected and edited a book of his poetry in English. Many of his poems are war and peace related, a persistent theme in his teaching, writing, and pastoral work. The boy in the poem is a victim of bombing, perhaps the atomic bomb. These were to be read by Wilbur Berkey, but uh, uh, he had a last minute conflict and he has asked me to read these two short poems. A boy is lying on the road, stretched out like a dried frog, spitting blood, which is parched and glued to the soil. He who was running with joy leaping with the first freedom he got and laughing with the blue sky is now lying silently and motionless on this road which is burning a fire with the sun. Pendulum, the terror of Abel, the first betrayed and killed the terror of Cain, the first to betray and kill. Between two terrors, we swig like a pendulum. Our next poem was occasioned, of course, by the war in Vietnam. Soon after turning 18, Bruce Weigel enlisted in the Army and served in Vietnam for one year, and he was awarded the Bronze Star. He writes, quote, the paradox of my life as a writer is that the war ruined my life and in return gave me my voice. Weigel's early work engages directly with the horror of his experience of war, while more recent work explores themes of family and childhood. His Buddhist practice influences his compassionate and unflinching attention to what he calls, quote, ordinary people in extraordinary situations. Carl Hurst will read the poem. After the storm, after the rain stopped pounding, we stood in the doorway watching horses walk off lazily across the pastor's hill. We stared through the black screen our vision altered by the distance. So I thought I saw a mist kicked up around the hoofs when they faded like cut out horses away from us. The grass was never more blue in that light, more scarlet. Beyond the pasture, trees scraped their voices into the wind. Branches crisscrossed the sky like barbed wire. But you said there were only branches. Okay. The storm stopped pounding. I am trying to say this straight. For once I was sane enough to pause and breathe outside my wild plans. And after the hard rain, I turned my back on the old curses. I believed they swung finally away from me. But 
Still the branches are wire. The thunder is the pounding mortar. Still I close my eyes and I see the girl running from the village, napalm stuck to her dress like jelly, her hands reaching out for the no one who waits in the waves of heat before her. So I can keep on living, and so I can stay here beside you. I try to imagine she runs down the road and wings beat inside her until she rises above the stinking jungle and her pain eases and your pain and mine. But the lie swings back again. The lie works only as long as it takes to speak and the girl runs only as far as a napalm allows until her burning tendons and crackling muscles draw her up into that final position that burning body so perfectly assumed. Nothing can change that. She has burned behind my eyes and not your good love, and not the rain swept air, and not the jungle green pasture unfolding before us can ever deny it. Two different people have informed me that she did survive and is now living in Canada. Our next poem is entitled uh, Memorial Day. And the reader and the author are the same, John Daniel Hess. Dan has often been with us in Sojourners from Indianapolis by Zoom. He says he's more a journalist than a poet. This poem was written on Memorial Day in 2008 when there were still 30,000 US troops in Afghanistan. He uh, says, I voted for Barack Obama but gasp aloud when he said he'd send more troops to Afghanistan. Dan has made a major contribution to Goshen College in teaching, writing, and SST leadership. Now retired, he tends his garden, communes over coffee, and walks next door to see his son Courtney's house. Dan says, quite often I've known the son or daughter of a father who served in a war to say that the father did not talk about the war and did want to receive questions about his experience. Perhaps if fathers and other veterans told their stories, children and the public would have a more accurate mental image of mortal conflicts. This poem is an attempt to catch these thoughts. Dan. Fighter, when you return home. Warrior, when you return home, describe the taste of gunpowder, the smell of clotted latrines, the bite of weak old ashes, Infantry man, when you return home, mention that you touched the tears of a mother in a darkened corner clutching a child who couldn't smile. Soldier, when you return home, repeat, if you can, the shriek you heard from the prison yard in the night. Gunner, when you return home, tell your people what you saw. The bridge bombed and the head of a man on a stick. General, When you return home, show with iPhone photos what a billion dollars can destroy.
Our next poem is by Carl Shapiro. It will be read by John Bender, and the title is The Conscientious Objector. Carl Shapiro was born in Baltimore, Maryland, studied at the University of Virginia and Johns Hopkins. His poetry received early recognition, winning a number of major poetry awards in the 40s, the Pulitzer Prize, Guggenheim Fellowship, Academy of Arts and Letters grant, and the Contemporary Poetry Prize. He served as Poet Laureate from 1946 to 1947. John. The Conscientious Objector. The gates clanged and they walked you into jail, more tense than felons. But relieved to find the hostile world shut out, the flags that dripped from every mother's window pane, obscene the bloodlust sweating from the public heart, the dog authority slobbering at your throat, a sense of quiet, of pulling down the blind possessed you. Punishment you felt was clean. The decks, the catwalks, and the narrow light composed a ship. This was a mutinous crew troubling the captains for plain decencies. A Mayflower brim with pilgrims headed out to establish new theocracies to west. A Noah's Ark coasting the topmost seas, 10 miles above the sodomites and fish. These inmates loved the only living doves. Like all men hunted from the world, you made a good community voyaging the storm to no safe Plymouth or green Ararat. Trouble or calm, the men with Bibles prayed the gaunt politicals construed our hate, the opposite of all armies. You were best opposing uniformity and yourselves. Prison and personality were your fate. You suffered not so physically, but new maltreatment, hunger, and new of the mind. Well might the soldier kissing the hot beach erupting in his face damn all your kind, yet you who save neither yourselves nor us are equally with those who dyed the blood, the heroes of our cause. Your conscience is what we come back to in the armistice. Our next poem is entitled The Divine Image. The poet is William Blake. It will be read by Ruth Horsch. William Blake, 1757 to 1827, was an English poet and painter and printmaker. He was largely unrecognized during his lifetime, but he's now considered a seminal figure in the history of the poetry of the Romantic Age. In 2002, Blake was ranked a number 38 in the BBC's poll of the 100 Greatest Britons. He was a committed Christian who was hostile to the Church of England, indeed to almost all forms of organized religion. Ruth. The Divine Image. To mercy, pity, peace, and love all pray in their distress. And to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. For mercy, pity, peace, and love is God, our Father dear. And mercy, pity, peace, and love is man, his child, and care. For mercy has a human heart, pity a human face. And love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. Then every man of every clime that prays in his distress prays to the human form divine, love, mercy, pity, peace. And all who must love the human form in heathen, Turk, or Jew, 
where mercy, love, and pity dwell. Their God is dwelling too. Our next poem is entitled uh, Globe Scope. The poet is William Stafford, and it will be read by Carolyn Hersler. Stafford was born in Hutchison, Kansas, and lived much of his life in Oregon. Since grass is universal, grass is our flag, probably means that our allegiance is, or should be, to peaceful, universal humanity, not to warriors like Beowulf who defend a nation's flag and kill. The use of grass may be a tribute to Walt Whitman. The world's people naturally sing, quote, the song of life and motherly love. He is a member of the Church of the Brethren. During World War II, he was a conscientious objector and worked in CPS camps. His poetry won a National Book Award in prestige, second only to the Pulitzer Prize. Carolyn. Grass is our flag. It whispers Asia, Asia, Dakota, Dakota, prairie, steppe. All over the world, it leans above rivers, Volga, Amazon, Ganges. A grass like wheat and its friend, the wind, carrying our message everywhere leaf by leaf. It is a good flag, but sometimes others hover above and all around us, relying on some great Beowulf satellite, infallibly orbited, loaded with warheads, patrolling, lashing a laser, and ready against all enemies. Then, Glancing from their high place, those warriors feel pity for us quelled millions, hostages to someone or some policy poised above us. Warriors can't think that way for long. It does no good to tolerate waverers. But grass is our flag with its little song carrying a breath and a pause and a breath again, a voice in the world like a mother holding her child in its cradle and caring, the song of life that all things utter to the world's people. And many will join. The breath of our lives is a pledge across years to each other. Whatever happens, we are faithful in that world story where the rivers flow and the wind discovers its great following and the grass whispers. Our next poem is by poet Wendell Berry, The Peace of Wild Things. And it's in contrast to almost all the previous poems because it deals with anxiety and peace within the individual instead of conflict and peace between the nations. And I dedicate this to everybody who's had a sleepless night. Wendell Berry is a poet, novelist, and environmentalist who lives in Port Royal, Kentucky near his birthplace, where he has maintained a farm for over 40 years. He has a deep reverence for the land. He's the author of over 50 books of poetry, fiction, and essays. His poetry celebrates the holiness of life and everyday miracles often taken for granted. This is our only poem that celebrates personal peace in the context of outward turmoil. Listen, when despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, 
I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Irvin and I thank all of the readers who carefully uh, and slowly read these poems. And now I invite anyone who wishes to um, offer a response to the uh, poems that we've heard this morning. Remembering to unmute yourself. <clears throat> well, thank you for the profound selection of, of poems. I can't think of a better way to celebrate Independence Day and our cry for peace. So thank you, uh, readers and poem selectors, Irvin and, and Vic. Um, I will add that um, both William Stafford and Yorofumi Yaguchi have been guests at Goshen College, guests of the English department. And um, William Stafford taught at least for a year at Manchester College. Maybe Vic mentioned that, but I, I missed it. Powerful and thought provoking. There's a student. Yeah, you're on. I'm on. Um, a student talked of conscientious objectors as getting inside the, inside the mind of the CEO, CEO. and I'm, I know that a number of you were of that mind, experiencing the life of conscientious objection during World War II, and for that, maintaining that witness, I'm grateful. Uh, more on William Stafford. He has a very short book of uh, memoirs from when he was in CPS. Um, it's very interesting and very moving. It's called Deep in My Heart. It's at least available in the Mennonite Historical Library, maybe in the public library. I grew up in a farm, a large potato, large potato farm. And after depression, it was a bit more difficult to find people to pick up all of these potatoes. And in about 1944 or 45, the owner contracted with the government to have German prisoners come to pick up the potatoes. And I didn't know much about the war or prisons. I knew there was a prison in Lancaster. I just didn't know what a prisoner of war would be. The day came and there was a large uh, a green or gray bus, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, filled with prisoners who came up by our little house on Colebrook Road 
could not turn into the lane. It, there were, it was too tight. So the guards got out of the big bus. It's like a, 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 yeah, a great, great big bus. The guards got out and then the, the soldiers got out and walked behind the guards in the long lane to the barn. I was upstairs at a window watching this in awe. And then I wanted to ask a question of mother. So I turned to ask and I saw her at the next window crying. I lived in Switzerland during the Second World War as a child. I remember the terror of possible bombings, of uh, running to a shelter, the sirens and all of that. And uh, I would like to thank all those who participated in this in this hour that is most inspiring about the evils of war. This is Anne Hersberger. I'm thinking about my brother, Willard Crabill, who was in CPS during World War II. And he was initially assigned to a reforestation project in Madaryville, Indiana. We had first cousins who were from the Lutheran faith and three of our first cousins were on the front lines with the US Army in Europe. And you can imagine the tension that existed between my parents and their parents as our sons were having, their sons were having different experiences. My brother decided that he wanted to have an assignment that included physical danger to the, ex maybe not the extent, and yet it seemed like it. He went into the smoke jumpers CPS um, experience in Montana and I was five years old when the war broke out. He was 10 years older than me, but he had just graduated from high school when he went into CPS. Anyway, I remember when his letters came, he had a total of, as I recall, 13 jumps. And at that time, my parents had never even flown in a plane. And here was their son jumping out of a plane um, that just highlighted for me as a child what dangers could be experienced in that kind of thing as well. But he was willing to take greater risk because of what he saw going on around him and even as close as his first cousins. I suppose following that, Anne, we should mention the several Hutterite young men that were tortured to death at Leavenworth Prison for their being conscientious objectors when during World War I, there was not as much of a provision for them legally, and they were tortured to death, sent home to their parents in an army uniform. Well, uh, anyway, I think uh, I appreciate all these uh, comments. And I invite uh, Irene to share with us what we need to know about uh, members of our class that need our support and prayer. 